Well, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me the privilege to be able to share from God's Word today. Uh, just a little background. Yeah, my pro life started in 1994 uh, with Pastors Emergency League when I started attending Pastor David Leapier's church. Uh, at the time I was involved in inner city ministry at the King Park Center. Little did I know that I would be getting involved in pro-life. I didn't even know what it was. And uh, he invited me down to clinics with him and Dale Demery uh, at the time. And there was another uh, pastor that uh, had joined us. And uh, the next thing you know, I'm preaching down there with them behind the mobile preaching unit, we called it, uh, hooked up with an amplifier and a microphone. And, and then we saw the battle. We saw the battle of Satan, good and evil. And we saw, continually saw God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness in standing for life. Yeah, we've had some rough moments when... Uh, Mr. Jones was in charge of the Milwaukee Police Department. He got rough for a while, but uh, after that, it just seemed like he died down and the clinic started closing, and uh, we give God all the glory for that. If you have the Word of God in front of you, turn to Romans chapter 1. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. You stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be in Romans chapter 2. I always stand for God's Word because I just have the reverence for the word, Romans chapter 2, part of my message uh, back tails into chapter 1, but Romans chapter 2, it's for, it says, For there is no respect of persons with God, for as many have been sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the mean, while accusing or else excusing one another. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, because we know your word is abundantly clear. We know, Lord God, that you are faithful. We know exactly today, as we are in church today, where you stand on the message of life. We don't need to look for it in any other form or manner. We don't need to dig deep into some theological discussion. We don't need to form a committee. We don't need to look around to figure out what it is that you try to say. But Lord God, you have clearly have defined life and your value of it. And we're thankful for that today. And Lord, I pray you guide me. May everything I say today be of you. Lord, I can't preach anything without you. I'm under no delusion to think who I am. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And Lord, I need you. I need you today, as we all do, Lord God. But to preach your word, and may your name be lifted up, have free course, and be glorified. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. My, my dad, Wayne, he was a, a history buff. And uh, growing up with him, I, I always said, you know, Dad, why do you like history so much? And uh, he said, history repeats itself. And that was his fascination with, with uh, history. And uh, George uh, Santillana, a Spanish philosopher, said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we've seen in our life, uh, we see the time when we have the knowledge more than any other time before. We have technology ever changing right before our eyes. We can get the answer to most difficult questions in minutes by simply pressing a few buttons. But yet this country is turning out kids who do not know how to think. They do not know how to use their mind to reason things out or to know how to apply logic to anything that they do for the most part. Yes, they're homeschooled kids, they're schools, kids in private schools that learn this, but for the most part. We have the technology, yet, but we're, 
We have the net maturity on kids who consist, consistently have low test scores compared to the rest of the world. Why? Because we lost the ability to think through our problems. We use calculators to add items up, but we don't understand how to add things up manually anymore. And I, I see that in, in the public schools especially. And they don't understand how numbers work. And uh, we, look at the, we look at the basics of, of math, reading, arithmetic no longer being followed. Uh, but we have machines that have been replaced to use our ability to be able to think and to be able to think logically on anything. You know, there's, there's an answer for something, and, and you look for a, a problem and an answer, there's a logical explanation to it, but instead of you and I stepping back and saying, well, we've got to think what the answer is, we, we go on the internet, or we'll go somewhere and talk to someone, they'll give us the answer, and we don't have to think things out anymore. But we've come to that point in civilization, especially in America, but today I want to talk in a message that I call the death of the conscience. And what is the conscience that's talked about here in verse 15? Well, what, what, is, what is God trying to say to us? Well, the conscience in the Strong's Concordance, it is the soul's as distinguishing between that which is moral and bad, prompting us to do the former and shun the latter, commending one and com condemning the other. A.W. Tozier, one of my favorite contemporaries that I, I've always enjoyed listening to, says, The conscience is the voice of conscience is over on the side of God, just as the voice of reason is over on the side of God, if we listen to it. And the voice of God's love is over the, on the side of God, and the voice of Jesus crying blood in the wilderness is also on the side of God. And all of these things, he says, are saying the same thing. Come home. Come back to God. That our conscience would be pricked. And either come to the Lord or come back to Him. The true conscience is the voice of God which guides every human heart. It guides us in all of our decisions, consistently persuading us to do the right thing. Since every human soul, which is the essence of human being, is made in the image of God, it can, it can survive only if it allows God's Spirit to dwell in it. Therefore, when we reject His Spirit, our soul goes into complete turmoil and total darkness. On the other hand, when we obey God's command, we find peace and joy because our soul is alive and resounds itself to God's Spirit. As we yield to the Word of God and the working of the Holy Spirit, we can become more and more sensitive to the voice that's in our conscience. But we also have the ability to dull our conscience by alcohol and drugs and idols, denial, unforgiveness, unrepented sin, and bring ourselves to a place of reprobation, which was in the case of Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, the reprobate gave himself to sin, although he was condemned by his own conscience. In this chapter of the reprobate, they think that God made them that way, but He did it. They chose that way. They knew God had revealed Himself to them, but they have in their conscience turned against God. They are doing it because they are in rebellion against God and His Word. What they are doing is wrong even though they know there is a time of judgment waiting for them by God in the end. They realize they are under the curse and wrath of God, yet that does not stop them from engaging in their foolish practices. Their own conscience condemns them of their own sin. In chapter 2, the, the verses that were leading up to the verses that I had given you today, it was also an, an important uh, set of verses that God had spoken of as impartiality, all will be judged. Saved or not saved. And they condemn one another because they are telling people what they are doing wrong, but yet they themselves are doing exactly the same thing. You know, it's easy to tell somebody, you know, you shouldn't be doing this and doing that, but yet they're doing it themselves. And the conscience can be conditioned and it can be changed. You know, uh, when I was a little boy, 
Uh, I stole my mom, close your ears. Uh, we had a Woolworths across the street from us, and uh, we'd walk in there and we'd steal gum. And uh, we didn't have money, that's no excuse, but I'm just you have to justify why I did what I did. We'd go in there and we'd steal gum. Well, you know, before you know it, uh, I walked out of there and I was guilty. I said, oh man, I'm shaking, I can't believe I'm doing this. But you know, it wasn't long before I went in there with a bunch of friends, and after four or five times, all of a sudden, we're out with big wads of gum, and our conscience didn't bother us anymore. We were stealing, we were not doing what we were supposed to do, but it didn't bother us anymore. You see, your conscience can tell you right from wrong, and it does, but you can condition your conscience to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. You can deaden the nerves, and all of a sudden, you can do something, and it's not convicting you anymore. I remember the story of Ted Bundy, and I remember, coincidentally, another story that I heard on TV about a famous hitman that was living in the United States. And both commentators asked the same question. They said, how is it that you can kill people and not let it bother your conscience? Well, they both said the same thing. They said, oh, at first I had sleepless nights. My, when, I, when, I did, when I killed my first person, I, I couldn't sleep. But over the course of time, and over the course of just allowing that to continually go, they got to the point where they were so cold, so calloused in their conscience that it didn't bother them anymore. That they could pull a trigger out of Harris notice and it didn't even affect them anymore. You see, you can change your conscience and you can get your conscience to be conditioned to your circumstances and your conscience is no longer effective. And we see that in life. We see that a lot with people. And we, we notice uh, some other things here as, uh, as I just want to bring some of that out. But we also notice that in life, the Muslims uh, that find themselves in airplanes, they want to fly these airplanes, uh, or they want to uh, blow up themselves in car bombs. Well, how did they get to this point where all of a sudden they feel that this is a good thing to do? You know, their conscience would say, it's wrong to murder someone, you ought not to do that. But yet, in their conscience, as they continually do, and as they continually think that they're doing what's good for Allah, and good for themselves, their fake God, they continually can do the killings. And, you know, they run themselves into a building, or they, they blow themselves up, and they think they're doing God a favor. And they created in their conscience a state of mind whereas they believe that they're doing something good when in reality it's foolishness. It's not of God. But you can condition your heart to do those types of things and think you're doing it for what? The glory of God? But these are some of the things that we can do to deaden our own conscience. And in the church, it's no different. Even Christians can change their condition of their conscience. You know, if you have a besetting sin, if you have something in your life that you want to keep, you don't want no one to know what it is, and you want to continually have that in your life, you can continually listen to the Holy Spirit in your life saying, don't do that sin anymore, give it to God, forget it. You can do that. But if you don't, you can get your conscience to adjust to your sin. And all of a sudden, Slowly but surely, the Holy Spirit's voice is no longer active in your life. And all of a sudden you find that you're doing the sin that you want to do, and there's not a conviction from God anymore. And it's not that God didn't warn, it's just that you continually told yourself that I'm going to continue on with the sin. I'm not going to let my conscience be given over to the Lord. I'm not going to let the Holy Spirit of God move in my life and change me, but I'm going to continually live where it is. It has never ceased to amaze me that we can live in denial of a sin we want to keep, either sins of omission or commission, either one. And for the average Christian today, who has dulled their conscience to the responsibility of standing in the camp of the pre -born. Uh, I found that in being involved in pro-life, it's one of the most uh, oxymoron types of things I've ever heard. Uh, I submit to you today that we are Christians, uh, we've had our conscience deadened by our surroundings more than we would ever care to admit. 
We've let the world condition our conscience to be more duller than what we would like to think. And uh, I include yours truly in that. I see that there was a time in America when we were sensitive to murder, but slowly but surely, through sin and through Satan just slowly working in our lives, America has become darker and darker toward murder. You know, it used to shock us when we see that someone was murdered years ago. We used to like, wow, I can't believe that happened. But slowly over the course of time, because of seeing it around in our area and seeing it on TV like every day, and I don't watch much TV, so I don't know what's even going on these days. But because of what's betrayed on TV, we've deadened our conscience to what murder is. And you see that the church of today is not involved in pro-life for the most part. There's over a million babies that are aborted each year. And I pray, praise God, I thank God that this church stands for life. I thank God that this church is willing to stand the gap for those that don't know. But you can see churches who will say, well, uh, what are you doing for pro-life? Well, you know, we have that, uh, we have that, uh, what do you do that every year? That, uh, yeah, we do that life chain thing once a year. Oh, okay. Uh, and then you probably get another church that says, well, you know, Maybe, maybe uh, in Sanctity of Life, we'll teach on the Sanctity of Life. If, if Sunday, maybe we'll preach on that. Okay, well, I get that. But how about, uh, how about meet me down at the clinic on Farwell and North on a Saturday morning to be able to stay in the gap for the women as they come in to be able to abort their babies? Oh, we can't do that. Oh, why can't you do that? You do some of the other things. Well, that's too controversial in our church. That's too much. We can't do that. And that's what I hear a lot. The pulpit has the responsibility to be the voice of God, and in His Word, it is filled with what God says is valuable in life. And like I prayed, it's not a mystery. In Exodus 21, 22, how about this verse? It says, A man strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely punish according to the woman's husband, well lay upon him, and he shall pay by as the judge demands. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But in case that one's not clear enough for you, you need one that's more, a little more clear. The Word of God says in Exodus 20, 13, Thou shalt not kill. That's about as crystal clear as it's going to get. Amen. Yeah. And we, we, we see that uh, the lie that is exposed in abortion, and, and thanks to uh, the education, and, and thanks to 2 and 3D ultrasounds, the pro boards, no longer have that old argument, well, it's just a fetus, it's just a little tissue. You know, they've grown out of that argument years ago. They know it's a baby now. And because the conscience of our society has been so deadened the way it is now, they can say unapologetically that we are killing babies, we don't care. And they, they don't even have to bat a wink at it. It is because society has come to the point, we are so desensitive toward the things of God, we are no longer fearing God the way we ought to. We think so little about life that the pro boards don't even have to argue about this situation anymore. The number one reason why we have abortion in this country, James, what's the number one reason? Selfishness. Selfishness. Selfishness, Selfishness and uh, it is a form of birth control. You know, Dr. Nathan said when they argued in 1973 for uh the uh, Roe v. Wade, his argument was, well, you know, if women women don't have these abortions, you know, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have these back alley uh, abortions and, uh, you know, the whole ugly thing, all well, that, oh, that was going to happen. And, uh, you know, they, they won that argument and since they've been killing. But that was a lot for the pit of hell. That's not the reason. And the reason is they do not want us to be able to dictate to them how and when they're going to have a child. You see, pro aborts aren't against children. They're against the time that they're having the children. 
in a person's selfishness and in who they are, this isn't the right time to have a baby because I've got my life ahead of me. Uh, I've got my career. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And a baby is going to make things so much harder for me to accomplish my goals. I'm sorry, but you placed a baby into this world that is made in the image of God. I'm sorry, but there's another human being that demands to have a voice to cry out for itself and say, I want to live too. Yes. And this is the point that the pro boards just can't understand. That there's another baby, there's a baby in the womb that demands to have a voice for them. And there is no one speaking out for the baby that's in the womb because our conscience in this society have been dead so far to the much that we don't care. And the church for the most part, how many churches come out to be able to stand on a given Saturday? Two, three? On a good Saturday? And the church isn't even standing, and the church is supposed to be the representative of God. The church should be the last stand before that woman goes into the clinic, and the church should be able to stand there and say, the Lord says, don't kill your baby. And the church should be the place right before that baby comes in that the lady has to go through the church in order to kill her baby. And as that lady goes through the church, we just beg and we pray that there's a conviction from the Holy Ghost into her life by either the signs, by the tracks, or by the street counselors, that that would prick that woman's conscience and say, I have a baby in my womb, I want to keep that baby, I don't want to kill it. And there should be an encouragement from those that are sidewalk counselors for that woman to turn around and say, you know what, I want to keep this baby. But the church has to be there. People ask me all the time when I was on VCY, and it was on, I was on uh, Voice for Life. Why do you have to stand down that clinic? Because a woman's conscience is not going to be pricked. It's not going to be set to the heart of this woman if I'm at home. i got to be there. What's the woman going to see if I'm not there? She's going to walk right in. But if she has to go through the church, if she sees that there's a loving group of people who are willing to help her in her time of need, She's already confused enough. She's already got the emotional up and downs like there's no end to tomorrow. The church who is firmly standing in the Word of God should be there to be able to say, you know what? What you're making is a bad decision. Let's talk about it. Amen. And give you the positive things that you can come through this whole situation. And you hear all of these success stories of women who kept their baby and good things happened. They were happy. Yeah, it was rough. Oh, and I'm not, I, I, I'd be the first one to tell you when I had my first child. You guys can speak when you had your first child. You, there were a lot of unknowns there, wasn't there? You didn't know how you were going to feed that baby, how you were going to take care of that baby. You didn't know how things were going to work out, how you were going to have the money to be able to do all the different things that are required to keep that baby healthy and to make it grow. But God blessed you. And God made a way out of no way. But we come to a time where because of evolution, it is easy to destroy the process of life. Because of evolution and Darwinism, evolution that has so much dictated this country, it's easy for this country to see. And it's easy to follow in those ways and to think so small of a child. And one of the arguments that I've always been involved in People say, you know, it's not that big of a deal that a baby dies in the clinic. Well, really. The same philosophy that holds true for the baby going in the clinic holds true for the elderly person in the nursing home. Mm -hmm. If you are not wanted, if you are not part of the status quo, if you're not someone that is wanted, quote, by society, if you can't have the quality of life that society says you need to have, and oh, by, well, by the way, Obamacare is all about that, because Obamacare is going to dictate to you when you're going to live, when you're going to die, what kind of medication you're going to have, when you're not going to have medication. And if they feel, by this board tells you, that you're not worth living anymore, they'll just stop all the medical things for you. And Obamacare is going to do that. And one of the damning things about Obamacare, while I'm on that subject, is that Planned Parenthood rejoices in, in Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Now why is that? Because it's free abortion. 
The state and the country is going to pay for abortion and for control, birth control. And who's going to make money off of that? Planned Parenthood. Everybody's going to have a right to it in Obamacare. But it's not a surprise to us who are in the church. The conscience of this society has gone downhill. And it's not a surprise, like I say. But there is a cause and effect for everything that you do. And for every action, there's a reaction. You see, we don't think about that stuff anymore. Our, our mind doesn't logically think, you know, if we allow this to happen, the consequence is this. And if we allow this, that. We don't think of that in our mind. We just... Boom, we're just going with it. We can't do that. We have to think these things out. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says this, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, Incandescent, fierce, despisers of those that those which are good, tra traitors, haughty minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, which should from which turn away. You think these people have lost their conscience? Yes. You think these people have lost their ability and their conscience to be able to do the right thing and to be able to say, you know what? I ought to mind my parents because they're my parents. Yeah. Where did that come from? That came from God. Yeah. I ought to love my brother and my sister Lord. Where did that come from? Well, that came from the Lord. Where are all these things about thinking of someone else before yourself? My self-esteem comes from helping someone else out. The Bible doesn't have the word self-esteem in it. It's esteem others. Where does that come from? That comes from the Bible. You see, when your conscience is real and your conscience is alive to God, and you allow your conscience to be molded by the Holy Spirit as Pastor was sharing just a few minutes ago, you grow and your conscience becomes more sensitive to all the things that God wants it to be sensitive toward. And that's the beauty of being in sanctification with God. It is the beauty of allowing yourself to say, you know what, it don't matter to me. I am going to let God do His thing in my life. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. I don't care what my fellow brothers and sisters think. I'm going to let God mold me. Because I want my conscience to be pricked to the heart in such a way that I'm sensitive toward the things of God. God will use you if you do that. Yes. God will use you. And I don't know how many times there was a voice that I heard by conscience saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. And I knew it was because I allowed myself to be sensitive toward the things of God. Now, am I always that way? No. I'm a work of progress. But I'm not going to sing the song, Carol. <laughs> but God is a God of order. God established the laws, and He established for us to obey them. The laws were established based on, from the Bible, what we use, of course, today, based on uh, Blackstone's commentaries. We establish laws in our country based on the laws of the Bible. And when those laws are violated, there's a, a consequence, there's a judgment from God for violating those. And God has to judge us, like in our text today, as much as He has to judge anything else. And there's a penalty for not following what God does. The health of our conscience is driven by how much God's truth we desire. Our conscience should only line up with God's laws. But there should be no there should be a hunger for us to know more and to have the Holy Spirit working us more. If you have your Bibles turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. I want to share something with you out of 2 Kings 17. And to give you a, a little background here, this is Israel coming to a point in their life as a country where they no longer heard from God, the fear of the Lord was no longer in them, their conscience was seared. In reading in verse 7, I'll let you get a couple more minutes to get there, I realize not everybody's as quick as I am because I have a bookmark. 
Second Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 7. You have to really let me know when you're there. Amen. By the way, I preached at the Milwaukee Rescue Mission last night. I had the opportunity to preach to her, and we had four men come to the salvation that night. Amen. I was uh, I had a message that I, I wasn't planning on sharing down there. I didn't think it was right for it, but I shared it, and uh, it all worked out. God gave me all the words. 2 Kings 17, 7, starting in verse 7, it says, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, which had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. You know, number one. What's, what's the number one thing to have your conscience seared from God? No longer fear the Lord. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. When you lose that ability to have the fear of the Lord in you, that's a tragic thing right there. But verse 8, I'll keep on going on. And walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and out of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things which were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all the cities from the tower of the watchmen into the fenced city. And they set up image in groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And here they burned incense in all the high places and did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets, and by the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I seen, and which I said to you, by my servants the prophets. Notwithstanding they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant, and he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them, that they should not do like them. And they left in all their commandments, and they left all their commandments of the Lord their God, and made their molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. You see, the children of Israel walked away from the Lord. And the Lord said, come back, come back, as A.W. Tozer said about the conscience. And they wouldn't do that. They kept continually hardening their heart. They wouldn't have anything to do with God. And God finally says, all right, you know what, have nothing to do with me. I'll let you have your own way. You can have the way that you want to do it and follow your own images and your old molten images that you have. But God's judgment will be upon you. And they made seven altars. And in these seven altars, they made of stone. And they had arms that would stick up like this to their idols. And they, they were on an angle. And they would place their babies upon the fire on top of their arms. And they would stoke the fire. And they would burn the babies. And as they burned the babies, they would play drums. And the drums would sound loud to sear out the conscience of the parents as their children were crying. And so, to sear the conscience of the babies crying, they made the drums louder and louder and louder. And you see, I'm not going through abortion techniques today. I'm not doing that. But if you ask me, or you ask James, you ask Lois or Frank, 
or pastor, will tell you, will tell you there's a lot of similarities in all of those things. But Israel was no different from us today. And in the Hitler's time, when Hitler was around, he picked up Darwinism in the book of Darwinism and wanted to have that Aryan race, A-R-Y-A-N race, of perfect human beings. They picked that idea up from Darwin and said, I'm creating an Aryan race. <coughs> Blonde hair, blue eyes, the women would be beautiful, and that they would have a pure race. They wanted to eliminate all of those races of people that were they, they considered inferior. They considered him inferior, but what did God say? He created man and woman in the likeness of his own image. Every man, every woman is valuable in the sight of God. Amen. Amen. You read Psalm 139. 139, Psalm 139 says it all. You were made as a special person in the eyes of God. Amen. And even if you're handicapped, even if you're in a wheelchair, even if you're 100 years old, you still have value in you. Why? Because you have a soul that God gave you and you're important to God because He can still use you. Hallelujah. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, God can use you. And how many times have we heard testimonies of people who were in bed, on their deathbed, witnessing to the nurses, witnessing to the doctors, people who no longer could move around. There was a, a, post, a pro-life postmaster in San Diego, retired, he said, Lord, what do I do with my life? Oh, boy. The Lord sent him out on the streets of San Diego. And he's been used ever since, as far as I know. But you know, the Aryan race that Hitler decided that he wanted to keep. And he allowed the Jewish people who he thought were non existent people. He thought that they were inferior people. And he thought that they had to die. And they would roll on their train cars, and they would roll past the churches on a Sunday morning. And as the people would cry for the train cars, as they were all pressed together in these train cars and crying out for help, the churches turned the organ up louder so they wouldn't have to hear the cries of the people. So that their conscience would be deadened, and they wouldn't have to deal with the fact that these are human beings that are rolling on the train tracks. Their conscience was deadened to the point where they didn't care. They encompassed upon the ideas of the government and much of that society, with, with the exception of the Niemollers and Bonhoeffers and a few other people who were uh, what they would consider uh, against the government and uh, were evildoers uh, against those people, most of Germany, most of society in that place, went along with the government. And because it's so much easier to indoctrinate kids, as little kids, and have them to understand your point of view and instruct them in those terrible and terrific ways they started them out as little kids, and document them the things of this Aryan race, and teaching them to believe that this is the way it should be. You know, we, we get upset to homosexuality and the homosexual movement in this country and in this state because they're trying to indoctrinate little kids in sexual education. And, uh, and the homosexuals with little kids. That didn't start with them. It started way back when. The devil started that in the Garden of Eden. But that idea was not original. And like pastors been preaching on Wednesdays, there's nothing new under the sun. That was an old idea. And they just took it and they ran with it. The devil slowly but surely works his way to remove the fear of God in the conscience of a society and allows the government to be dulled. We know that Margaret Sanger, who was the originator of Planned Parenthood, had the same thought. She had the same thought that there were inferior people who were not smart, who weren't able to think right, and we ought to just do in with them and create our own Aryan race. And so, uh, without going into a whole other sermon about all of that, and uh, thanks, Lois, for that DVD that you gave me, by the way, that taught me a lot about that stuff, that, uh, and, and the slavery and all of that. But, but, but besides that whole area that we can't get into today, she had the same philosophy, that people were not, were not all equal. There were some people that weren't able to live. And her goal was to use abortion as a means 
to exterminate a race of people. And besides, besides, we have overpopulation we have to deal with. And so she was active in all of those things. And so that's not a new area either. But you see, this country has fallen away and deadened our nerves to the things of our conscience. And then we've allowed the things of this world to dictate to us how we're going to live our life, how we're going to do the things that we do. The evolutionary lie has crept into the world and has crept into this society so much and has overtaken any form of godliness that we rarely see anymore. Evolution took off in our schools, took off in our government. And when all of that happened, there was no life anymore in this country. It's all dead. All there is is a sliver of hope that God is going to somehow make a way again. But I will tell you this, as I have I preached this for years in, in Romania, in, in Poland, wherever I preach pro-life, no country that ever promoted the baby killing and homosexuality ever was able to stand the test of time. They, they never were able to stand, but they continue to go. If God does not judge America for the 40 to 57 million babies who are blood or crying under the streets of our cities, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. The conscience needs to be pricked. And ultrasound is one of those areas that we have a positive thing going where it is. Texas recently passed a law that states that a woman seeking an abortion must see an ultrasound to hear the heartbeat of her baby. Praise God. Amen. That's a way that we could use. That's the way God could use to prick her heart and her conscience. To say, listen lady, shake you up. Lady, that's a baby. Also, Amendment 26, the Mississippi Personhood Amendment, is a citizen's initiative to amend the Mississippi Constitution to define personhood as the beginning of fertilization. That did not pass, but it'll come back up. Did you know that Liberty Council has been very active in these different areas? And uh, there's a number of bills, pro-life bills, that they've been able to be able to uh, challenge and to be able to win. And uh, they have successfully argued before the U.S. Supreme Court regarding the rights to sidewalk counselors to peaceful present alternatives for abortion. They filed uh, an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court to successfully defend the federal law basing a ban on personal birth abortion. Settled federal lawsuits against the state of Mississippi when more than enough certified voters <laughs> Signatures were secured for that amendment that I had just talked about, and Planned Parenthood wanted to shut it down, not included in their voting. Uh, I admire Matt David. There's, there's other uh, organizations out there also that are doing good. I told you about the Texas law. There are 11 states now that require verbal counseling or written material to be included in their information, uh, and, and according and, and also uh, EQ. Uh, including ultrasound services. 19 states regulate the provisions of ultrasound by abortion providers. Six states mandate that an abortion provider perform an ultrasound on each woman who seeks an abortion and requires the provider to offer the woman the opportunity to view their image. Nine states require that a woman be provided with the opportunity to view the ultrasound image if the provider performs the procedure as a part of the prepared uh, abortion. Five states require that a woman be provided with the opportunity to view the ultrasound image. Twelve states consider are considering right now to pass similar laws. Connecticut, Indiana, Kansas, Maryland, Missouri, Nebraska, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina. Texas was on that list, but they just passed their law. Virginia and Wyoming. And lastly, and lastly as we close, God is able to be able to prick the conscience and bring life back into the church, back into the life of the church user, and to show them that they need to stand. God has sidewalk counselors trained to be able to do the things they do because it's a last-ditch effort to be able to save a baby's soul. We are our brother's keeper, in case you want to know. 
we do have a responsibility as a church, as a human being that is alive, to be able to stand in the gap for those that have no voice. We have to be a people who are concerned about the murder of the innocent. Something has to happen in our conscience where again God awakens it. And God not only awakens it, but we said, you know what, we've got to do something now. We can't just sit back anymore. If we stand in the gap and we stand for the life of these children, I can promise you it's not going to be easy. Lois, do you like going down to the clinic? James, do you like going down to the clinic? Frank, do you like going down to the clinic? There's a million things I would rather do than go to the clinic, including clean my bathroom. Because I just hate being there. But I realized this one fact. That there was one who stood in the gap for me when I was lost. There was one that took no thought in his mind to come down from heaven, to come here to this earth to stand for me when I had no voice. When I was on my way to hell, when I was on my way to be able to die in my spiritual condition, there was one that was named Jesus Christ, and he held up nothing. He came down and he gave it all. He did something that I would probably have never done for no one else, to be honest with you. But he came. And because he came and he made a difference in my life, and because he pricked my conscience, and because he turned a light bulb in my head, I feel in my heart and in my soul every day the value of life. Not just the life of the baby, but older people. Just in human beings, just my, my brothers and sisters, I, I feel the value of life because I have life now. And the life that I have now, I didn't understand before I was saved, but because my conscience is free, because God did something in me, I understand it now. And I realize that I've only been saved for 20-something years, but I realize i got a long way to go. But I figure if I, could, if I got that much now, I think what happens in another 20, 25 years, James, and... God don't come back, take us home. We need to stand in the gap for those that have no voice. If you can't make it down to the clinic, pray for those that go down. Yes. If you can't make it down because you just physically can't, and, and staying there is too much for you, or being there is too much, when we have our time here on the second Saturday of every month to go down to the clinic, make it a point to be a watcher on the wall and pray. Pray for those that are going down. Pray that God's protection would be upon us. Pray that God's holiness would be in us. Pray that the Holy Spirit would work through us and prick the conscience of a man and a woman that is going in that clinic that they would scream, as Lois would say, in that clinic and turn around and come out. That the power wouldn't work. Boy, we've used that one and it's worked a couple times. Including the time that we went to Water Street and the clinic was closed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> was that a day? I will never look, I'll never forget the look at those pro boards when they came in to think that they were going to be open house, business as usual, and uh, they tried opening the door and they put it open. <laughs> you know what? That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. We serve a God if we are willing to go, if we are willing to do, if we do have the faith of a mustard seed, God will do the rest. I'm confident of that, and I'm confident that God will give us an opportunity to be able to share. And in my years, I can't tell you how many opportunities I've had to share the, the gospel with a man or woman that were walking to the clinic, and I'm down the street from where the clinic is, or the mill as we call it, the business, and I'm able to share, and it's like the escorts don't even see me talking to them. It's like they're blinded to what's going on. And God's given you the ability to speak to these people and you're saying, oh God, I know this is up to you, hallelujah. They may or may not walk in, but you know, God's given you that special time. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many blessings I got and I get from being there. Do I want to be somewhere else? Yeah. Would I rather be doing something else? Yes. But you know what? God's called me to be a soldier for Christ. And as a soldier of Christ, and being a soldier, I'm asked to go places that I don't necessarily want to go. I'm asked to do things that I may not necessarily want to do.
But you know what? If I'm a good soldier and my commanding officer tells me I've got to go, I'm not going to go AWOL on here. I'm going to serve him and serve him all the way home. Let's pray.